Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, my position of tonight equals that of the seventh husband of Elizabeth Taylor, who said on her wedding night to his newly acquired spouse, my dear, I understand what is expected from me, but how can I make it still interesting for you? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is entirely my position also. I know what is expected from me, but I hesitate whether I can still make it interesting for you. Not because Albania or the Albanian people aren't interesting enough, far from it, but simply because there is so much to tell and yet so little time available. Well, also, I would like to add a very clear disclaimer. I am not an Albanian expert, but rather an Albanian specialist, meaning that I have specialised my interest, study and activity towards Albanian and the Albanian territories of southeastern Europe. In any case, in writing on the website and through this introduction, I am certainly ready willing and hopefully also able to share with you some observations and perhaps for part of the audience some revelations since Albania, in all honesty, is not very well known in the Netherlands until now. Next slide. One of my observations regards the unfortunate fact that in the Netherlands there is a lot of prejudice towards Albania and the Albanians. If more time were available, I would have asked each and every one of you to write down your first association, the first thing that comes to mind when thinking of Albania. I'm quite convinced that some of the phenomena listed on the PowerPoint sheet will actually equal your associations. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no point in denying that in the Netherlands we often tend to think in the negative when it comes to Albania. Well, think again. Because the negative phenomena just listed actually concern the Netherlands, not Albania. Now, this is perhaps somewhat of an eye-opener to some of you, especially the foreign participants, who we heartily uh, and warmly welcome uh, here, by the way. Yet this is exactly what I intend to do tonight, to open your eyes and your mind, and for some of the Albanian, for some of the Albanian backgrounds that have played a role in the Balkans for quite some time now. Ladies and gentlemen, next to lifting some of the prejudice, I would like to provide instead some basic information on the Albanians. I intend to address two main issues tonight, Albanian territory and Albanian identity. While I take the opportunity to welcome the Ambassador of Kosovo and the Minister Council from Albania. In this short presentation, I skip the huge territory of the ancient Illyria, whose existence is well established as well as the existence of an Illyrian language. While I shall return to the specific Illyrian-Albanian connection under the ensuing chapter of Albanian identity. Mr. Chairman, allow me to commence here at the point of, in history of the 19th century, when the Ottomans still occupied the Albanian territories and had divided this area into four distinct provinces, or vilayets as they are called. In these provinces, the inhabitants spoke primarily Albanian, while Albanian culture was predominantly present and people associated themselves in first instance with the Albanian identity <coughs> rather than any other national or religious identity. To visualise this, I use here an ethnic map from the website of David Jon Godfo, the Balkans correspondent of Dutch broadcasting company NOS, which will be... exactly. Nowadays, the Albanian territories concern all of the Republic of <coughs> Albania, most of the Republic of Kosovo, the northwestern part of Macedonia, the southeastern part of Serbia, as well as, perhaps to a lesser extent, the northwestern part of the Hellenic Republic, plus the southeastern part of the Republic of Montenegro. Irrespective of the correctness of this map, or any other ethnic map for that matter, what is certain in any case is the fact that the Albanian people are not only harboured in the nation-state Albania, but also in neighbouring countries. This problem is usually referred to as the Albanian question. Perhaps, Mr. Chairman, we can return to the previous slide for a moment. The main cause of this um, Albanian question is that in the 20th century, on the 30th of July 1930 to be precise, it was decided in London by the so-called great powers of those days that on one hand they recognised Albanian independence. Albania had declared itself independent from the Ottomans on the 28th of November 1912. Yet on the other hand, 
The new Albanian principality, which the great powers established, concerned a much smaller area than the Albanian territories under Ottoman rule. Ever since 1913, the Albanian people have sought to regain land that was considered, and often still considered, to be Albanian. This is one of the many dimensions of the Albanian factor in the region. Obviously, that presents tension with those countries who have proclaimed since 1913, or even before that, after the Congress of Berlin in 1878, that this land was actually theirs. Albanian independence was originally foreseen for all of the Albanian territories, but eventually resulted only in a tiny nation state. And it left nearly half the Albanian people outside Albania's borders. By and large, the borders of 1913 are still the same as the current borders of the Republic of Albania. The most meaningful manifestation of the aforementioned ethnic tension came to the service in full in 1999 in what was then the Serbian province of Kosovo, and later in 2001 when conflict emerged in the Republic of Macedonia. Intra-ethnic tensions there could mainly be contained and channeled through dialogue, while in the case of Kosovo the outcome was warfare. This crisis led eventually, on the 17th of February 2008, to the creation of the Republic of Kosovo, as the second Balkan country that is predominantly ethnic Albanian. In Albania proper and in Kosovo, the Albanian identity is obvious and not in any way questioned. While in the other areas mentioned, the situation is more complicated. Ladies and gentlemen, one may wonder, on an evening like tonight, what exactly makes an Albanian truly Albanian? That is probably the central question at hand here when discussing Albanian identity. Again, for the sake of time, I will have to skip the various sub-identities, such as the cultural groups of the Geks in the north and the Tosks in the south, or the sub-identity of the Iberish, which regard the Albanians who have settled since the 14th century on Italian soil. Well, I want to just merely mention the ancient um, Northern Albanian common law, which is known as Kanun, and the particular tribal social organization through clan communities or fees. While the connective vendetta and sacred oath, the so-called Bessa, also really need an extensive explanation at a different moment. Even though there is certainly very interesting Albanian regional cultural diversity available in the Balkans, which translates as regional folklore, customs and traditions, I would like to focus here on what all Albanians have in common, that is their national identity, in the sense of a system of norms and values coupled with national history and national myths. The Albanian identity presents itself through some main features, of which I have selected a few national myths and characteristics. First, the Albanian ethnogenesis myth. In other words, where do the Albanians come from? While there is very interesting theories on the Thracian and Pelasgian origin of the Albanian people, the least controversial theory concerns an Illyrian-Albanian connection. This connection assumes a linear link between the ancient Illyrians and the modern Albanians. Even though this is a commonly accepted assumption in the academic arena, debate on it uh, takes place still. The permanent presence of Albanians in the Balkans is, in any case, part and parcel of the Albanian identity. Then the second myth, as commonly accepted concept for which full proof is lacking in various aspects. The second myth regards a story that revolves around the Albanian national hero Jerzy Kostrioti, better known as Skanderberg, who for a quarter of a century kept the Ottomans at bay and managed to unite the Albanians. Skanderberg icon role relates to, first and foremost, to maintaining Albanian unity, defending Albanian territory against foreign occupation, and also defending Christianity against the introduction of a new religion, being the Islam. Later, this Albanian unity was reinvigorated through the Prison League in 1878, when the Albanians not only resisted their Ottoman occupier, but also neighbouring Orthodox countries that were threatening to invade Albanian land, which they actually did then, as well as later during the First and Second Balkan War, and again during the First and Second World War. I see various people nodding, so this seems to be in part a familiar story where Albanian territory was promised to Orthodox Christian countries, such as Greece, Montenegro and Serbia, which in effect seriously endangered the Albanian nation in the Balkans. Thanks to the Priestland League, the Albanians became better aware of their identity and also better aware of what was required to defend their identity, meaning in particular 
a central organization, armed forces, strong leadership and funding. In other words, the basic requirements for self-administration. A third pillar of the Albanian identity is a very clear and indisputable one, being the Albanian language. This unique branch of the Indo-European family tree of languages regards an extremely beautiful as well as complicated tongue to learn. When I shall retire from some of my current duties, I hope to learn this language that was established as standard language as recent as 1908 at the Congress of Monastir. A peculiar phenomenon of the Albanian language, which is written in Latin letters, is that there are 36 instead of 26 letters, whereby Albanian also has certain double letter combinations which are counted as one. It is this Albanian language that unites the Albanians in the region of southeastern Europe, but also links them to the Albanian diaspora all over the world. The importance of language as a uniting factor was better realized in the 19th century when the so-called Renenja Komatar emerged. Gentlemen, leads us to the fourth element of Albanian identity that I want to highlight tonight, which is religion. Contrary to Orthodox countries like Greece and Serbia, the Albanian national identity does not entail an intertwining of ethnic and religious identity. In effect, the Albanian identity is based on language rather than on religion. Now, one could talk for hours on Albania and religion. Uh, there's many things to story to tell. But let me remind you that the area of what is nowadays called Albania was before the Ottoman invasions divided into a Catholic north and an Orthodox south, divided in the middle by the Skumbin River. Gradually, Islam was introduced by the new Turkish masters, to which Albanians massively adhered. But in particular, because of tax invasion reasons and new career opportunities. They can therefore be seen as crypto-Christians or pseudo-Muslims, rather than fully converted uh, Muslims. The Albanian territories have always been known for their religious tolerance and absence of religious fundamentalism. The Muslim community traditional concerns the moderate Sufi branch of Islam, in particular the very liberal and tolerant Bektashism. Later, under communist rule, Albania became an official non-religious country, which still has its effects on modern society in Albania. In this modern society, many people will rather adhere to what Vasos Skodrani called Albanianism. <coughs> Albanianism is the belief in everything that is Albanian, rather than any particular religious conviction, which Albanians often see as a private matter and a subject of far less importance than Albanianism. It has been the very strong belief in Albanian identity, <coughs> which created in the 19th century an Albanian nationalism that was defensive in nature rather than a nationalistic or expansionistic policy. In the 20th uh, century, Albania faced other types of pressure, and actually also repression, in particular during the era of communism, and with it a period of international isolation, which ended as recent as the early 1990s. It is in my view only since Albania overcame the so-called pyramid crisis of 1997 that Albania opt has opted for its final orientation on the Western world and the Euro-Atlantic structures, which Albania has already joined in part by becoming NATO member in April 2009. Probably means my cue to end this short introduction on the question of who are the Albanians. For those of you who do not know the Albanians, I insist that any chance you may obtain to get to know them, you should directly grasp. You will then see that even in this day and age, Albanian hospitality is overwhelming and that people highly appreciate foreign visitors. This feeling for tradition is also an important element of Albanian self-identification. I'm not entirely sure, Mr. Chairman, whether we in the Netherlands will demonstrate equal attitude when the new EU visa regime enters into effect on the 15th of December of this year. Mr. Chairman, I hope that all in all, in Europe, we may bridge the past and will focus on the future of the Western Balkans and Albania's special role in it.